Yolanda with Conversations with Yolanda. You guys know when we're here, we're talking to entrepreneurs and, and, and authors and speakers and people in ministry and people starting business during the pandemic. And today I have my friend here, Keith, that we're gonna be talking about technology. Where are women in that space in technology and investments? and some other things that may come up during our conversation. So Keith, thank you for being here with me today. Oh, thanks, Yolanda. I really enjoy having met you in real life, having met you earlier on our clubhouse time together and just really grateful to be here. So thanks a lot. Yes, let's talk a little bit about our face-to-face -face meetup. You know, a lot of people are meeting up on clubhouse and this weekend was phenomenal for us, a group of us to meet in person. Tell me a little bit about how did you get started doing that? And why, why did you think it was significant? So uh, great question. Uh, I call them IRLs or in real life events. And I've been on Clubhouse uh, coming up on nine months pretty soon. So end of December. And what has been great about the Clubhouse experience is you can spend a lot of time getting to know somebody through the tonality of their voice and the content that they're, they're sharing. And so over a time frame of potentially hours, you really get to know somebody like how you and I've gotten to know each other in some of the rooms we share. And so as much as I love Clubhouse as many people do, I've always felt that it was a tool to generate authentic connections and network. And one of the, I don't normally make New Year's resolutions, but the one I made in 2021 was to be very intentional about how I network with people. So uh, we're doing an audio podcast, but on video, you can tell I'm, I'm Asian American. I grew up in a very traditional um, Asian setting, but also uh, being a believer and coming from a family of believers and multi-generations, even though our relationship is directly with Christ individually, uh, there's just some parallels there. And we generally don't like or don't know how to leverage our network. So it was just very timely that as Clubhouse came into being for many of us, as you got to put your trust in people and got to know them, it's like, I would really like to meet people in person. Okay. So I'm a Californian. In mid-April, things started to open up in California and I started to host in real life events in California. And those were phenomenal. And it was a really a reflection of who I am as a person. So as a believer, I, I try to be in the world, but not of the world. And so I have lots of different concentric circles. And so our first event, there was over 60 people. A, a number of believers, but also technologists, investors, startup founders, and people from other walks of life that aren't necessarily believers, but are very friendly towards us. And that was something that people felt was needed because of how much we've been locked down for the last year and a half. And I was able to then do those in Las Vegas, in New York, in June, um, back in Southern California, back in Northern California or Silicon Valley, where I'm at. And then most recently, even though you and I have known each other for months, this past weekend, because I'm not sure when this is going to air, but this past weekend when we were in the Washington, D.C., DMV area, and that was a really interesting meetup because each one's a little bit different. And I would say that one has been the most, there's about 20 of us, but that was been the ones where these are like diehard clubhousers for the most part. <laughs> and so when you listen in those conversations, because I knew most of the people, but I didn't know everybody, which is typical, when you can hear like, oh, I remember you and you're in this room and this is what we talked about. And I just really love seeing the authentic connections that were happening uh, this past weekend. So that's what my take was on in real life events or IRLs. Yes. And that was my first one. I am a born networker. People have had me do trainings on how effective networking goes. I've always been able to connect very easily in multiple sectors and go in the room and not know anyone and connect. I've just always been able to naturally do that. So with Clubhouse, because I've traveled so much internationally, I was like, I need my people, I need people. And so being able to connect with people from around the world on Clubhouse and then meet some of those people in person that without the Clubhouse connection, I would have never met. And so for me, this weekend was, was great. And, and the same for me, I was listening to people like, I remember your voice that you were in such and such room. So it was great to be able to sit at the table, even if everybody's not a believer, I think we're supposed to be light in the world. And so I believe we're gonna be put in different situations in different places to be that light. 
And so I've always been able to do that. I know for you, you're, you're in some of the tech space. Can you talk a little bit about the spaces that you've worked in since your career started and kind of where, where you are right now? It's a great question. Thanks for asking. Uh, I, I'm an example of a non-linear career path. So when I got out of university, I was accepted into Wells Fargo when it was a good bank. It was a lot of rumors now. <laughs> to the commercial banking program. And this is, I'll date myself, this is post-savings and loan crisis in the United States. And so although there are 5,000 applicants, 13 people selected each year, of the 13 of us, none of us actually, we were trained as bankers, but none of us actually became bankers. We got different roles and different jobs. So for me, I got into credit analysis and then um, very timely, the largest bank merger in global history at the time, which is very tiny today, was first interstate uh, being acquired by Wells Fargo. Mm -hmm. And as a young man, this is all God's providence. Um, I had been asked to join the team and, and I had some, I was talking about this in a clubhouse room last night that uh, on women in tech and how to get a career in technology. So I'll start there that although I've loved computers since I was young, I didn't study computer science. I was not a software developer. Um, I've, I've been on the business side of technology, but based on this period where there's a lot of automation, which is happening today, even now that the bank saw my skills in being a tester of the system. Today we have QA testers back then it was user acceptance testers. And they asked me to go along for the ride. And so as we were adopting or acquiring this other peer bank, how do these systems work together? And so after that concluded, I was a software program manager for about two more years. And then Cisco Systems hired me. And this is during the dot-com era to lead technology M&A integration. And that was a wild ride. That was uh, over 52 acquisitions in three years. I worked on 37 of them. And then the dot-com crash happened. Well, and so remember, <laughs> yeah, and this is back if people remember what stock valuations are like today, back then Cisco was a very high flying company. So the stock went down by over 90%, which is insane. Wow. It was typical. Oh. Yeah. And I, for all intents and purposes, there was no real MA going on at that time in the industry. So again, by the Lord's leading, I ended up doing technology deals. And so for the rest of my career, even to this day, as I've been on my own, um, I've been going back and forth between very large companies, helping them either with M&A integration or operations or technology or technology risk and doing deal making. And so uh, I kind of rose up the ranks. I went to a company that got bought by HP, an Israeli startup called Mercury Interactive, went back to Cisco, took over my boss's job. And he happens to be a very devout believer as well, which has always been a blessing. And we're mm -hmm. still friends. And then I went to Intuit leading technology uh, partnerships. And then I finally finished my career, a uh, corporate career with the Bank of Tokyo or MUFG, leading aspects of technology risk. But what I'm saying is like six years ago, I felt led after I left corporate, I didn't feel that that was where I wanted to be. I started doing consulting and that's kind of led into being a startup mentor. I've been an angel investor for over a decade, but now I'm very active as a startup mentor and an angel investor. Mm, wow. So in the, in, in your career span, we know that technology has changed, Silicon Valley has changed. What are you seeing different with tech companies since the pandemic? What, what are you seeing the shift be for companies or the pivots happening with companies uh, when the pandemic hit in 2020? Great question. How did companies pivot in the technology sector? I'll make three observations. The first observation is that the giants, so, I don't know if everyone always thinks of amazon.com as being a technology company versus a fulfillment company, but in essence, Amazon is a technology company. Amazon's done very well for itself during the pandemic. People want uh, remote access to their goods. They don't want to go into physical stores anymore. So it is a general rule, the large technology giants, Microsoft, Google, they've done extremely well. And then there's this whole concept of digital transformation that many of the non large, many large companies that are not technology companies, they've had to force their digital transformation, we say by five to 10 years. And wow. those that have done well have embraced digital transformation. And we're not talking about just the customers, although that's important. We're mm -hmm. talking about the future of work. You've heard a lot of stories about people who didn't traditionally have access to working from home, that now they have access to working from home. But this caused new challenges. So now we talk about, I grew up at companies that all had geographic salary structures and coming from Silicon Valley, 
Silicon Valley usually having the highest salary tier. Mm -hmm. Very different salaries than you would be in the Midwest, for instance. Mm -hmm. However, now companies are pushing back. Like, yes, Yolanda, you can go work in Kansas. But we want you to take a salary adjustment. And that's been a very difficult conversation to have. So the success of those large companies are also tempered by there's new paradigm shifts in how people work. Uh, I've had a number of guests on my ra radio show, Silicon Valley Insider, which is not faith-based. I am working on a faith-based show, mm -hmm. but Silicon Valley Insider has, just like my network, a number of different guests who talk about the future of work, how that's going to be an impact. Then in terms of startups, startup funding got very narrow during the pandemic. And so many startups ran out of funding, and that's been a severe challenge. I usually recommend, of course, it's always pie in the sky, that to advise a startup, you really want to try to have two years of reserves to last. And we see that the pandemic lockdown was about 18 months. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of capital. Don't get me wrong. There's a lot of capital, there's a lot of access to capital, but you may not have the network to access that capital. Exactly. So therefore, the general question of how has the pandemic affected the tech sector? It's been a mixed bag. The large technology companies had a stronger footprint. Companies that were able to adopt digital transformation um, did that well, were able to thrive. Companies that couldn't figure it out uh, kind of fell by the wayside. And in terms of the startup sector, if you had a strong network, if you had a strong model and you had a strong platform, you were able to get money. If you were just starting out and you didn't have that uh, depth of a network, you're probably struggling a little bit. Yes, yes, yes. Because one of the things that I saw when you talk about the way work is changing, I worked with several companies to help them transition their staff home. And I think a lot of times when companies do that, they forget that they sent them home. <laughs> so I have to start talking about the HR side of the human capital side of your company. How are you making sure that those employees are being taken care of even though they're at home and you don't see them. So sometimes out of sight, out of mind. And so I've been doing a lot of training as there are actually some of them are beginning to bring some back and then deciding that we're not coming back. Like some of the banks was like, we'll have everybody remote. And I, I asked the question, so when you onboard a new employee, how do you get them integrated into your you know, existing teams? And they were like, hmm. So one of the things that, that, that I think is gonna be coming, I've been having a lot of conversation, I wanna get your feedback on it, is the AR VR space and how we can integrate some of that onboarding and connecting with the team that's already existing in those spaces, putting the headsets on and letting them meet each other and, and those kinds of things. Where do you see that, that going in reference to work, the AR VR space? That's a great question as well. Augmented reality and virtual reality. I don't have the predictor to know exactly where it's headed, but I could tell you some of the companies that I've spoken to and what they're working on without giving away anything confidential. Yeah. I think there's a large market opportunity in AR and VR for education, corporate education. I think though that in terms of adoption, you have to think about companies that are large and have significant budget to do corporate training. You have to think about purchasing the headsets, what technology exists, technology shift, and what the content's gonna be. So I know of one company trying to make inroads into corporate education. And they supply the headset, and they supply the content, or they co-develop the content with the, so let's call it the education, the HR team. Education sits in different parts of companies. So yeah. an HR team is sponsoring some educational content, and they want to be able to use AR and VR headsets so that the coworkers, their employees can get the experience of having in-office training, right? That, that's a, a very common theme that's coming up again and again. I think that it's interesting that they're trying to replicate a group experience in remote locations. And I think that there's other technologies being worked on to try to capture that. So for instance, what is the next iteration of a Zoom upgrade or one of these streaming platforms that can handle that type of experience? And is it done over a Zoom or is there a new platform or an existing platform that will be changed in order to have that group experience where you have 20 or 50 people using AR VR headsets to engage with each other. I, I think it's gonna be interesting. I think also in terms of technology being new, it's a little disorienting as well. Yes, 
Yeah, the things that you're sharing is what have come up in the conversations that I've been having. Um, in, in the tech space, especially investing and getting capital, we see articles and we see conversations that's happening that, that say that women are being left out. So how do, you, how do you see women really being able to come to the table or what have you seen as some of the obstacles that's keeping them from, from gaining capital in your experiences? So specifically into women, and by the way, my technology show which has been on for four years, two thirds of the guests have been women in underserved communities, which I'm quite pleased about. It was never intentional. It's just, I think yeah. uh, being a person of color as well, just the observations that knowing that there's more of a tech community than what we're traditionally think about. Mm -hmm. So Silicon Valley has a term, it was in Emily Chang's book, Rotopia, it's called the blue flame. And the blue flame were traditionally two white male founders, uh, usually in their mid to late twenties, maybe having graduated college, maybe not, uh, maybe being in a PhD program at Stanford, like the founders of Google or the founders of Yahoo, for instance, uh, de deciding to commit their entire lives to their tech project, You know, not necessarily dating, not necessarily with any other obligations other than working on their startup. That blue flame concept is embedded or ingrained in tech culture. And sometimes when we talk about systemic biases, it's just unconscious. It's not willful necessarily. Sometimes, of course, it could be, mm -hmm. but it's not conscious that I'm choosing one over the other. It's just something that people lack the education of. Mm -hmm. So once we get past it, let's assume, let's assume that for the most part, people are um, have good intent, that they're not systemically understanding that they're holding people back. Then it's a question of what are the systems in place or what are the groups in place to kind of help that along? And so whether it's women or underserved communities, that's awareness. And I think that in terms of how women in particular should be seen in terms of their tech experience, there are now targeted funds, targeted um, investors that want to serve explicitly female founders. Mm -hmm. And I think what happens there, like I represent an investment bank in San, headquartered in San Francisco, US Capital Global. Um, not, I'm not an investment maker, I basically scout for them. Mm -hmm. And the whole reason why I bring that up is that investment banks are syndicates. And so when you, and I'm not advocating for one or the other, but it's just one way for female founders or any founders to think about in this pandemic era, where money is available, but you need to be able to get access. You have to build that network up. That's what we talked about you know, a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. And having that strong network, developing a relationship with somebody who can help represent you, then that opens doors for you in other frames. And so whether it's an investment bank or other syndicates, like I said, I'm not pushing one over the other. It's that really key is I think a lot of times founders pitch, but they pitch in the dark. It's like basically just like that whole analogy, like just putting spaghetti on a wall and hoping it sticks. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a waste of time, actually. I think sending out, uh, back to the earlier conversation about intentional networking, I never do cold calls. I never facilitate cold calls. Uh, warm intros or hot intros, that's where you want to get into. So like, as l your listener base knows you, you land it, builds a relationship with you. You can say, hey, I'm working on this project. You're going to be transparent and say, like, I know exactly the right person for you. I might not. I might refer you to my friend Keith. Mm -hmm. And Keith might be able to help you. And you know, the majority of times I might not be able to, but I might know somebody that can. Yeah. And that's, I think, where the power. And that I want to shift a little bit. That's what mm -hmm. I want believers to focus on. I mean, anyone should do this, but in terms of our community, I think a lot of times back to comparing, uh, for me, Asian tradition and, and, and Christian beliefs, we want to be humble. We don't know how to ask for help. It's okay to ask for help. You just don't want to do it in an obnoxious way. You exactly. want to do it in an authentic, genuine way where you're building community, gaining trust, and then basically being authentic about what your ask is. And the recipient should be honest about what they can do for them. And I think that's biblical. Exactly. So now that we've shifted to that, I want to ask you, in reference to your faith, I know for me, my faith has really been in the front of everything that I commit to do, that I, with people I connect with, um, it's really played a, a, a tremendous role in my work. Tell me how your faith has influenced uh, your work in your career. It's a powerful question. I think sometimes people are uncomfortable answering it. Yeah. 
So I don't have a day in my life where Christ isn't real. I accepted Christ at a very young age, but that wasn't defined who I was. And, I, and everyone's experience is different. So I'm not going to say that anyone's ever born um, into being a Christian. It's really just the self-identification of when Christ speaks to you. Mm -hmm. But that's never altered my life. So whether it was through elementary school, middle school, high school, college, or into my career, it's a very active component. At the same time, I think in the West, or especially in America, I think sometimes we get a little concerned about how we can live our faith out without being judged or how people see us. Mm -hmm. And I think the answer to that is, and we talk about this in Clubhouse, where I am the co-founder uh, with Lance Joe on the Christian Professionals Club, which is open to anyone. And we have a very mosaic culture and how we handle um, our members is that I think a lot of times we think of our life as a pizza model. So we have our family life, our work life, our volunteer life, our church life, just different slices of a pizza. Mm -hmm. And I think God calls us to have a hub and spoke model where Christ is the center of our lives and anything we do, he's there. And whether we're being overt about it because that calls for it or whether we're being more quiet about it because it just doesn't make sense for us to be overt about it all the time. I think that's fine. I think that's where the situation calls for. I think uh, we, we, as I've done missions work and I think about other countries and I'm not going to name them for this show, but I can talk about it offline. There are certain countries, there are democracies, yet it's illegal to proselytize. And it's also illegal for say a pastor to receive donations. So then how do they actually earn a living? Well, they do it the way that they used to do it in biblical times, they tent makers and they, their vocation is part of who they are. And although in the West, we enjoy freedom of religion for now, Mm -hmm. um, the point is that as people have taken a stand, sometimes it's uncomfortable. Sometimes they lose their jobs. The Holy Spirit calls you to live your life the way that you want to live it in harmony with how Christ is called. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you're going to be in seasons where, like for me, I, I've, out of my entire career, I've had a lot of great bosses, but I've only had one great boss that aligned with our faith. And we didn't wear it on our sleeves, but we did know that we shared that faith and we both knew that we had a Christ-centered life, right? Um, there's been other bosses I've been extremely close to that aren't Christ followers, but they knew that I was a Christ follower and they respected that. And I've had bosses or a boss that was actually uh, very hostile towards believers. And so regardless of what season you're in and who you're interacting with on a daily basis, just know that you can be confident in your identity of Christ and that those seasons, um, he will get you through it. Exactly. That is so good, Keith, because I think a lot of times people shrink back because they're thinking they're two different people, that I'm a believer outside of work and I'm just my career and whatever my title is inside my work. But for me, I come as who I am. I come as a believer. And a lot of times that can come through how you treat people, how you do business, how ethical are you in your business and how are you treating people? And, I, and what I have seen and experienced is that when I am treating people well, when I'm going over and above, they come to me and say, something's different about you, what is it? And then it opens up the, the window for me to really share who I am because they came and asked. And so I think we can, have great impact as believers in the marketplace. My dad was a pastor, but I always knew I would be in business. And I, I always tell people, I'm a minister in the marketplace and God has positioned me. I will always be connected to the church. I was serving the church, but I always knew that I was called to the marketplace and called to business. And God was gonna use me in, in tremendous ways as a believer in the marketplace. And so I want to encourage those that are listening or watching this podcast and that are maybe struggling with that, uh, connect and network as Keith has shared with other believers in the marketplace, whether it's on the clubhouse meetup that they, we do with Christian professionals or other live events where you can see other people in the marketplace that are, are living out there their uh, Christian uh, beliefs within the marketplace. I have two more questions before we close out, Keith. I want to ask you, what is one thing that, that you're working on that's like a passion project for you? Well, I have a lot, but one I'll, I'll bring up is a, a company, an e-commerce company that is called Soapbox, S-O-A-P 
app-bx.com. It is transforming e-commerce for the app for in two ways. So one is, um, let's say that you have a Shopify, Etsy, eBay, Amazon storefront. Uh, this is where the costs involved with that and the management of that could be very, very daunting. And so uh, Soapbox started about a year and a half ago. Um, it's done quite well. It's gotten uh, significant funding. And really, it's a freemium model for under seven cents a transaction and even lower. Um, somebody who's got an e-commerce storefront um, can basically reduce their shipping and operational costs. And it tracks all your inventory and, and your oh, orders. Wow. So it, it's something that uh, people can ask me about directly. Uh, they can ask you about. It's just something really, really straightforward to do. The, the more passion part of it is uh, the, lib and this is something I talk about because it's more of a startup phase. Uh, the CEO, Danny, he was uh, so humble about it. He had not thought about the B2B, that's B2C, what I was just talking about. As he's entered B2B and has actually become, in essence, an automated 3PL or third-party logistics company. Uh, at scale, he's been reducing significant costs for some of the largest brands and uh, it, it literally sells itself. So this wasn't meant to be a sales thing, but it's just meant to be that if people are struggling with um, e-commerce, uh, the B2C is a self-service, a no-brainer, and the, B2, the B2B, business-to-business uh, -business aspect of it, uh, there are companies that have been struggling with their third-party fulfillment and logistics mm -hmm. and have gotten quite a great advantage out of that. So that's one passion project. Yes, yes, yes. One of the things I started with my company is, is a philanthropy store. I do a lot of work in third world countries, uh, and mission trips, and I'm always looking for funding to not just go on the trip, but when I'm there, make something happen on the ground for the people there. A lot of times we go, we're like, oh, that was a great trip. And then we come home, it's like, what do we do on the ground for the people there other than you know serve while we're there, which is great, but how can I fund entrepreneurs or how can I help women that know how to sew start a dress shop and and so I open the store and just selling different products in store so I need to talk to you about that. <laughs> that that and so that money goes toward mission trips and mission projects on the ground and I've, I'm, I've always I understand that if God gives me wealth and, and as the wealth that he's given me it's not just for me I've always known that that what he gives me is for me to be able to make impact for other people. And so that's why I wanted to ask you about those passion projects and how you're helping, you know, businesses or individuals in, in the space that you're in. And then my next question is, what are you reading right now? What book are you reading? So uh, right now, let me finish off on the last topic too. Like yeah. one passion I have overall, because we're talking about tent making. I think there's people in seasons right now, and I'm seeing a lot with people who've been in corporate. And it's time that they move on uh, or that they're trying to figure out what does it mean? I talk about a future of work. I talk about automation. I talk about this looming thought that because of artificial intelligence automation, uh, many corporate jobs as we know today won't exist in five to 10 years. Uh, McKinsey says 39 to 73 million US jobs alone, which is about 50% of the professional labor force. And so I'm passionate about helping people figure out, and I do that through startup mentoring, and I do some professional development as well, but it's how do people, no matter what degrees they had or didn't have a degree, what the role is, are you prepared if your job goes away and how would you handle it? And it might be becoming an entrepreneur, it might be starting a consulting business on your own. So that's what I'm passionate about. That's a conference, Keith. We need a conference. <laughs> Yeah, and that's what I believe. I'm telling you, people are not prepared. And I was watching a video and uh, it was in a conference setting where I was speaking and they showed a video and they showed all these robots working in hospitals, making burgers. And the people that were probably a little older than me and was almost at retirement age, but they had maybe 10, 10 years left. They were like, well, what are we gonna do? They were just distraught. They left that conference. <laughs> just really worried about where jobs are going to go. And I said to the to people in the room, figure out how to fix the robot, how to program the robot, how, how to design something that's connected to the robot. But figuring out where is your place within that is so key for now. And so I think that's, that's a great, uh, I don't know if you've had any of those conversations on Clubhouse about that, but I think we definitely 
should be talking about it and showing people how to prepare for that. Well, that's where I'm, I am headed. I think a lot of the content I say on Clubhouse, back to what we were saying about being integrated in our entire life, I'm talking to people on Clubhouse who aren't necessarily believers about these concepts, and I'm also wanting to pivot that into the radio show I'm going to launch yeah. um, about how to do this for believers as well, because it's not it's not a different conversation. It's the same conversation. Exactly. I think the different conversation is as uh, believers possibly feel more and more persecuted at work, as some do, and I've got lots of stories um, that I've been collecting on that as well. I think that's where whether through automation, whether through just job elimination, or whether um, you're just tired of corporate life, that there are different ways to become a tent maker as Paul was. Mm -hmm. And I'm passionate about helping um, give, giving technology and resources for people to figure that out. So that's really what I wanted to say about that. So tell me a little bit about your radio show that's going to be for believers. Kind of how do you see, uh, what are the conversations uh, that you're going to be having on that radio show? So it's exactly the conversation you and I are having right now, Yolanda. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Christian Professionals on Clubhouse is a little less formal, but it's basically that we have our whole lives, as we discussed, that we are a hub and spoke versus a pizza, and that it's not these different aspects. And, you know, church is awesome. I think we are called to serve in local churches, and sometimes for whatever season we don't, but that churches don't do a few things. I've talked to a lot of ministry leaders and they're not equipped or they don't focus on what we call, some people call the gap. So you, you graduate high school, you start into a vocation, you go off to the military, you go off to university. And for me, I was in university, I was in a fellowship. Between the time we graduate from university or if we don't go to university and the time that we get engaged and then have, uh, get married and have kids, most churches, to my understanding, don't really have a lot of content. They might have a fellowship, but they really focus on aspect. Who helps us with navigating promotions? Who helps us with a conflict at work? Who helps us when we have a boss who hates Christians? Mm -hmm. um, nobody really helps figure this out. Or in terms of, and, and I'm not an expert in these areas, but like fertility planning or right. um, child rearing or elder care, all these things that we as a network of believers could be helping each other out with and not necessarily even in a church context, just as a friend yeah. or a person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think we're, we're, we are reluctant to have those conversations because we don't know how to. Yeah. And so what this show is about is helping people have those conversations, equipping them to understand that uh, we don't start and stop our Christian life at church. Exactly. <laughs> oh my goodness. One of the things my church did during, uh, right after the lockdown and everything was opening back up. And in Virginia, where I, I, I'm in the DMV, but I live more on the Virginia side and go into DC. And one of the things we started doing was connect groups. We were like, and they were nothing to do with the Bible study. We did one on marketing, fishing, golfing. <laughs> we did it on all these things because a lot of times Sunday we come in, we come in for the service, we leave. We really don't connect with people and really get relationally getting to know people. We see them on Sunday, we speak to them, we talk to them. But those, those, those activities allowed us to see them pass the church doors. What were they like outside of the church? Well, oh, I didn't know you had a boat or I didn't know you could really golf this well. And so I think <laughs> the conversations, and they didn't know I can golf so bad. They were like, uh, you know, I was like, no, I just need a little more practice. But just like you just said with the conversations with those different other things is that we have to have a platform and a place where those conversations can take place. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what I, I think is going to be the crux of the show, which you definitely should be on when we get that started. Absolutely. And I've been having lots of conversations. I think it's uh, timely. I think back to that we enjoy certain freedoms um, being in the U.S., but it's a different, it's also because of that, we don't necessarily understand that in other cultures, other societies, other countries, you don't have that freedom. And so all you have is the ability to um, have your vocation and that you then are, in, through that vocation, you are a minister. Yes, yes, yes. And that's what we have to really, because a lot of times I think people that are in corporate or in their career field, but not on the platform preaching, feel like they're not ministering. And I think we have to continue to communicate. You're in the, and allowing pastors and ministers to share it from the pulpit that we need you in the marketplace. 
You represent us in the marketplace. You don't have to be in the pulpit to be a minister or to be able to minister to people. And I think we don't hear that enough in church and people that are in those spaces feel like they're doing nothing. So we have to remind them, yeah, you need to be in, that, in, in the marketplace as a believer. And so my last question for you is, I always ask people what they're reading. I like to hear about what people are reading, what are they focused on uh, with their reading. So would you share that with us? Sure. So from a, um, you know, a business standpoint, I'm reading a lot about uh, influence in social media. Mm, that's right. Good. I think I think that goes hand in hand. With what we talked about today is how do we help teach people that uh, you are an influencer, whether you believe it or not. I came out of a culture where I didn't really like to talk about myself and I'm still having struggles with that very transparently. So as I start uh, a faith based show, it's understanding uh, that you and I are influencers. We have a community. And how do we develop that? So there's a lot of tools out there, a lot of techniques out there. And something that I think uh, back to the pivot we've been talking about before, that because of the last two election cycles, because of uh, people's views of mainstream media, there's a lack of trust. And so yeah. trust is going to be put more into uh, people who are developing their own communities. Uh, you see it with TikTok. You see it with uh, Reels. You see it with lots of different. Now you see it with your, your podcast, yeah. my show. So I think that's where that's really important. And then um, I've been reading a book. I'm trying to find the author because it's been a while, but um, basically finding your ex. So as a believer, what is God's calling for you in your life? And so it's, it's very thematic. I mean, it's everything we've talked about today. Yeah. And um, yeah, I've been traveling a lot. So I put the book down. <laughs> so I'm trying to find the title. But um, Exactly. That's so good because I was just talking with some young people that have enrolled in school, but really don't know what they want to do. And, but they, what I realize is that they don't understand that the work that they do should be tied to their purpose, but some of them don't even know what their purpose are. Uh, and, and, and what they, and sometimes they've heard people share with them, you're good at this, you're good. And they had so much in their head that they're just like, I don't even know, I don't even know. And so as young people, I think with young people, we should start early having them identify what is that thing you would do even if nobody paid you? What is something that you just like, everybody asks you to do because you're so good at it and you enjoy it. But I think more of those conversations, especially with our young people, so that they're not just going to college for four years and then was like, oh, I don't even like this. <laughs> That's a whole different conversation about uh, what are we really getting the value out of universities now? And oh that goes my back goodness. to what I said yeah. about earlier. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very, I have a daughter who's 16, a son who's 11. And um, it worries me that as much as I know that they're going to go to university, are they going to get what they need out of it? And is it going to be something that's going to be valuable, right? And I, and I, I do worry about that. I have concerns. Mm -hmm. And I think, I think the university setting in the next 10 years is going to totally look different. Oh, yeah. Because I think some students, I was just talking to my son, he was like, should I go get an MBA or should I? get a cybersecurity, he's, he's in technology and finance. I said, you may not need an MBA, you may need just certifications. And so having them look at the cost and the debt you're gonna get versus do you really need that? And I think universities are really having those conversations about credentialing and doing more of that with corporations and individuals and not just pushing everybody to a four year degree. And I think more of those conversations are going to continue to happen, especially after the pandemic. I think I think they really saw it. Like uh, these kids can just go online and get schooling anyway. They don't even have to come to our campus. And well, so <laughs> why would you get a Harvard degree when you're doing it remote and seventy five thousand dollars a year? Uh, my my daughter, I actually kind of made this sort of a joke. It was like, well, if you could start university, or if I just gave you the money for your startup, that's equivalent. Which would you do? And that was like she doesn't have the answer yet. But I mean, that's something that. Exactly. If you have the means, would you would you rather get started on your startup or would you rather put it in a in university? And, and right now it's university, but I'm just saying that that right. is a conversation that probably isn't that far out there. Oh, I did I did pull up the book that I'm reading. It's uh -huh. um, X Multiplying Your God Given Potential. It's by John Bevere. Oh, I love John Bevere. I, yeah. I have several of his books. I'm actually reading The Circle Maker. Um, um, it's, it's National Community Church, is a, he's the pastor of National Community Church, but he's written all of these books. I'm, I've just lost his name, he would be so upset with me. Uh, uh, 
circling uh, prayers around all of your biggest dreams and visions. And uh, I, I read that book every year because I read his testimonies of the things that were like huge projects. He had no idea how he was going to do it. And, 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 and because he prayed over those things, he just began to see the fruition of what his, his prayers had been with him and his team. And so that's one of the ones that uh, uh, I'm reading this, the circle maker. But thank you, Keith, for joining me for this conversation. It's been great. We'll have to do it again, but I appreciate you taking some time out to join me today. And those that are watching this podcast and listening, what is one thing you would say to those that may be struggling, trying to figure out, they have a company, but they're trying to figure out how to pivot? What are some, what are some encouraging words you would give to them? And the encouragement is that many startups don't succeed on the first try. And that's natural and it's expected. I think there's always a fear of failure. And so not to worry about that. I think the key is to, in terms of pivoting is, what are you going to pivot into? Why are you pivoting into it? And uh, what have you learned from the lessons that you have right now? And how are you going to apply it to your next business? I think also that uh, there is a lot of capital out there. And the way that investors want to look is there's some aspect of what have your wins and losses have been. But as my business partner and I talk about in terms of uh, our startup advisory, we invest in people, not companies. Yeah. And so I think uh, that shows through in, in genuine conversations. And I think that's where I think a lot of people get stuck and there's a lack of confidence. So if you have a good idea and you're pivoting and you're able to support that financially, that's great. Um, if you need help with that, then you need to know the right people to get a hold of. Uh, I, I've just had this conversation um, twice in the last couple of days with different industries and different companies. Yeah. So great idea, lack of capital. Uh, capital will be deployed, but lack of um, the right idea or, or product yet. It, it's a dance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But that's really where the fun is. And I think um, the, the key goes back to what we said earlier. If you're in a startup, figure out a way, ideally, to have a couple of years reserve um, minimally so that you're able to pivot, do all those other things. If you've ran out of time and money, then you really need to make some hard decisions. But it's not something that other people haven't faced before. Yeah, yeah. One thing you said I want to remind the people, we don't uh, invest in projects, we invest in people. Invest in people. That is so key. And a lot of times people forget that, that it's not just about the project, it's about the people. Because it's a long-term commitment, it's not just over after the, the commitment is made. So Keith, thank you so much for joining me. And we will talk soon. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Yolanda. And uh, really enjoyed seeing you in person. And we definitely will talk soon. Thank you. Yes.